Hello. My name is Valentin de Laplace. I'm an engineer at Google Cloud and I've been writing some Go code as my primary programming language for many years now. I'm so happy to be here with you in Belgium today to present in 65 slides or so the new feature released earlier this year in Go version 1.18 that everyone has been asking for for over 10 years now, which is of course fuzzing. I'll start with an overview of some of the tools included in Go's SDK and then I'll introduce fuzzing, explain what it's for and I will launch a live sample. Tooling is a long detour but it's really important. Let's go. Of course we can run unit tests and integration tests out of the box with the command go test. Okay, my tests are passing. That's a relief. We have test coverage, which is a percentage of your lines of code that have been visited, that is executed by your automated tests. Here we can see that I'm reaching 62%, which means that I can do better by writing more tests to cover more possible cases in order to maximize the total coverage. No need to reach 100% though, in my opinion, it's not necessary and it would be deceptive as you can have all of your tests passing and 100% of coverage and still have plenty of bugs that show up in production. A large test coverage is mostly a nice to have, but not a guarantee of any kind. The test coverage is a nice tool for human developers who use it as guidance to write extensive tests, but as we will see in a few minutes, it is also extremely useful to power some other instrumentation technology. We have a built-in benchmarking feature which lets us easily measure execution times in order to optimize them when possible. For example, here we can see that function B is, taking, is much faster than function A. The two functions have been executed thousands of times each and it turns out that function A uh, took uh, 73 microseconds on average while function B took 31 microseconds on average. So if you've written B as a replacement candidate for A and you've ensured with extensive tests that A and B are indeed equivalent, they are doing the same thing, you can now decide to replace all of the calls to A with calls to B because B is faster. We have a fantastic built-in data race detector that is used to discover concurrency bugs where synchronization is incorrect. These bugs are sometimes waiting the worst possible moment in production to occur and are notoriously difficult to diagnose, to reproduce, to debug and to fix. Here the race detector uh, has detected that a variable has been read and written to in a concurrent and anarchic way by two different goroutines without properly using a synchronization device like a mutex or a channel or a weight group. As the race detector is a nice guy, it displays the two guilty lines of code where the bug happened, so we can go and fix it. We also have built-in CPU profiling by sampling, which records at regular intervals at runtime the call stacks of the currently executing goroutines, and then provides infographics that show the functions that burn the most processor time, in a graph where we clearly see who was called by who. This is extremely useful and it's called pprof. And if you have never tried it yet, I highly recommend it. Now the flame graphs are based on the very same profiling data and are a slightly different graphical representation of it, very nice and interactive. We can click on a specific function to zoom in and inspect where the CPU time is spent. 
We have built-in tracing, which is about recording all the function calls dynamically in order to visualize if each of our CPU cores is spending its time working or whether if it's mostly idle. Each line here is a CPU. The timeline is interactive too, that's very neat. You can zoom on a specific millisecond and click on a rectangle to discover which function was executing on this processor at this millisecond, etc. This is very nice and very useful. And now we have built-in fuzzing. But before I explain fuzzing, I want to emphasize that all of these instrumentation tools are integrated in the standard Go distribution. This is extremely important from the structural and sociological point of view to have this common framework, this tooling collection that will be supported uh, in the long term by the Go project. You can be confident that they will still be working in one year, in two years, in three years. And this shouldn't prevent us from using uh, third party uh, tooling like uh, Testify or Datadog, etc. But there's a huge added value in the long term to have a rich standard tooling properly integrated and supported. That is tools that play nicely with each other and also with the future versions of the language. So what is fuzzing? Fuzzing is a testing methodology based on randomization of input data. What does your no, how does your function react when it gets bombarded with thousands of I weird inputs that it wasn't really expecting? This is what your function looks like. It's taking inputs, like arguments. It's executing instructions. The blue listing here is your code. And it's producing side effects and a result. Here is what your automated tests may look like if you're doing some kind of table-driven testing. You're calling your function on diverse handwritten test cases. Then you inspect the results and check that they are correct or that they look correct. It's slightly different than a regular unit test. Most often by comparing them to expected values that you've also written by hand. We sometimes call them the golden values. So that's uh, regular table-driven testing. You also check if the side effects look correct and if the program didn't crash, for example, by panicking. Fuzzing starts from a small number of input test cases provided by you, uh, the sample corpus, and generates thousands of variations that it injects into your program. Of course, for each execution, it inspects the outputs, the side effects, and the potential crashes. I want to emphasize that any of these checks might discover a bug or even a serious security flaw. We'll discuss the security aspects in a few minutes, so stay tuned. Note that there is an asterisk on the word random. Indeed, the fuzzer does use a pseudo-random number generator, but it doesn't work completely randomly. Just like a truffle hunting pig that searches truffle in the ground, the pig doesn't search completely blindly. It also uses its olfactory senses, its intuition and its cleverness. These Orange diamonds here look conspicuously similar to each other, as if they were related, don't you think? I will try to explain why. So, theoretically, when regarding the program as a black box, the fuzzer would have very little information for guidance, like have I already found an incorrect result or a crash? This is very binary, yes or no. And it can't really know or sense that it's getting closer to an interesting case. Here is the magic. The fuzzer can access all of the information about the program under test, including the code coverage. Which lines of code have already been visited or not? 
Whenever a new test case grows the test coverage by executing a line of code for the first time, we regard this test case input as interesting. We keep it and we mutate it in the hope of reaching even further to new lines of code that have not been executed yet. For example, if we're encountering for the first time a panic or a fatal or an error F, etc., then it means that we found something that is more likely to crash or to produce wrong results. See all these lines of code in bright green there? This is the code coverage. The fuzzer is cunning like a burglar. It tries to visit, that is to execute, all the lines of codes that it doesn't know yet. So the fuzzer is putting itself in the shoes of a hacker, bombarding your programs with variations of inputs designed to make your program fail. If it finds bugs, that's great, you can still fix them. On the other hand, if you don't run any fuzzing by, your, by yourself, unfortunately, some bad actors on the internet will do it instead once your program is in production. And that's way more serious. This brings us to the fundamental question, why should we invest effort in fuzzing? It's actually a crucial security concern. All of your servers are processing some kind of input data. For example, HTTP requests that can be more or less complex. And you can't always trust 100% of your users to be well-intentioned. And hope is not a strategy like, I hope nobody tries to abuse my server. As a consequence, doing input validation and cleaning the input requests is necessary, but not sufficient. Writing various relevant automated tests by hand is useful, but not sufficient. And using automated fuzzing to simulate a malicious attacker is, in my opinion, absolutely vital. I didn't say it was sufficient. Let's have a look at what fuzzing looks like in practice in a Go test file. Uh, on the official website go.dev, we can find this example of fuzzing. This is a function to reverse the order of the characters of a string. It's not too long, it's not too uh, contrived, but still leaves some wiggle room for the human to not immediately see if the code is obviously robust or not. The algorithm of this reverse function consists of swapping uh, the first character with the last one, then swapping the second character with the second to last, etc., progressing towards the middle. If we want to carefully review this function and write unit tests ourselves, we will focus first on certain edge cases. Are there cases where accessing the I index or the J index would panic because of an out of bound uh, index? What happens when the input string is empty? Uh, if the number of characters is odd, are we correctly taking into account uh, the character in the middle? And by the way, do we even need to do anything at all with the middle character? This is what the first function looks like. The syntax is not important. It's easy enough. When you try it at home, within five minutes, you'll have figured it out. Let's demo the launch of an already written fuzzing test. I'm switching to the terminal and launching go test with the first parameter. So, will this work in this directory tuto? Uh, it contains a file reverse test.go that I, I can show it here. So this is the function reverse that we've just seen and this is the fuzzing function. Okay, let's launch it. Go test dash fuzz equals the first target is called fuzz reverse. Let's see. Uh, it was quick to find something wrong. It says reverse produced invalid UTF-8 string 
escape something, escape something. Uh, let's see, in the, in the code we have two assertions. One is based on the property, if I apply the reverse function twice, I should always get back my initial input. So reversing a string twice should be the identity function. And this worked, it, see, it seems. And the other assertion was, if the input is a valid UTF-8 string, then uh, it's, uh, the, the result of reverse should al also be a valid UTF-8 uh, string, which was not the case here. The assertion was uh, violated, and we can see that the further found it and reported it for us. So that is a bug that needs to be fixed now. So actually, the original bug was to conflate, to conflate the character number i with the byte number i. In Go, accessing the element number i of a string works at the byte level. But when we're talking about reversing a string, we need to work at the UTF-8 character level, which may span several bytes. In the end, here, the fuzzer didn't find a crash or an out-of-bounds panic. It detected an incorrect result, where the invariants, so the assertions, have been uh, violated. There was a clue in the code. We can see the explicit cast of a string into a byte slice. However, experienced gophers know that in order to process the characters of a string, it is not appropriate to look at them byte by byte. I'd like to show how to write a fuzzing test from scratch. Let's do this. Um, in this folder, I have nothing, I think. So I will uh, initialize a new module. Let's call it process or whatever. It doesn't matter. Let's create um, a test file, process test.co, and maybe VS Code will let me uh, edit that. Okay, let's work in a package process or whatever, it doesn't matter. So you have a function process which takes some input, so a string as an argument, but other uh, types are also possible, of course, and it does nothing. I can write a, fuzz, a fuzzing target for that, func fuzz process. Uh, yes, thank you, VS Code. It's taking as an argument a testing.f. Okay. So, how fuzzing works, we need to call the function, no, the method fuzz of f, which itself takes a function, which takes a testing.key. It's a little bit heavy, but whatever. And then, uh, variadic arguments that will be uh, randomly generated by the fuzzer. So here I'm interested in generating variations and mutations of string, so I'm taking a string as argument. Okay, so this anonymous function, what does it do? It needs to call process with this parameter a. I think I have everything needed to launch the fuzzing. Let's see. Uh, go test uh, dash fuzz equals uh, fuzz process. So what is it doing now? It's uh, trying to make it fail my my function by generating thousands and thousands of uh, inputs of uh, strings to make it crash or panic or uh, violating the assertions, uh, and it it seems that it can't uh, succeed uh, because process function never panics and never misbehaves because it does nothing. So it could uh, uh, keep spinning and searching forever. It will not find anything. So now you'll have to use your imagination. Let's say this is your business uh, code, which might be much longer than uh, zero lines, but it has a bug. Um, it would accept only um, strings that are longer than uh, four characters, let's say. So if it's less than four characters, it doesn't crash, it just returns and does nothing, no bug, okay. And uh, on a specific input, a equals to a character, uh, to a string that has only one character, it would panic, 
saying um, found a bug for input uh, this string. Um, if anyone is not asleep yet, can you please provide me with uh, one letter, one ASCII letter, please? H. H? Okay, I wasn't expecting that, word, that one. I hope it works. Maybe A, I don't know. <laughs> okay, let's see. Um, so there is a bug. We, as, as human, we know because we can read the code that it will fail on the input edge, but the fuzzer do doesn't know it yet. And it turns out that I think the fuzzer doesn't take into account the source code. It could, in theory, but uh, actually it's much more interested and focused on the code coverage in its uh, way of doing things for now. So if I... Uh, launch the fuzzing again, what will it do? It will try many strings. Maybe it will uh, find a bug. I'm pretty surprised that it doesn't. Oh yes, I know, I know why. It's because I asked it to ignore small string. So mm, maybe it's too soon for that. It will not find the bug if it returns before. Okay, so I still say the bug only exists for the exact input string H. Uh, here it find it. Found a bug for input H because it's starting with small strings and there are not thousands of uh, combination of string of having length uh, zero or one and it didn't even ne need uh, longer inputs uh, of size two or three because it found the bug uh, input H very quickly. Um, no, now let's uh, try something more difficult. Um, if we say you still have to use your imagination, your business code is more complex than that, but it's just a sample for, uh, for the demo. Can you please provide me with four ASCII characters, please? Six, eight, yes. A, Six, eight, A, B. Uh, that's a tough one. I don't know if it, uh, if it will find the bug or not. Let's see. As I mentioned, I think it does not read the source code. Yeah. So it will try to, to make some progress and to uh, discover uh, this input that will make the program fail. So the bug, it's trying, trying. I suspect it will not find it within a reasonable amount of time. OK. Uh, that's the perfect moment to uh, demonstrate the feature of uh, adding some interesting inputs. Like if you have some valid inputs, it's great to, to build by yourself a sample corpus by calling f.add. Um, and then you, you will trust the fuzzer to generate slight variations of this input. For example, it can be uh, 68am. Mm, so it's, it's different, but it might help. Let's see. I hope it does find it. I expect it to find it. Let's see. Yes, it did. Found a bug for input 68AB. So that's a difference. Uh, before uh, having a, a corpus with one input that looks like the, the, the guilty input, it did not find it. Uh, now it did, which is what was expected. Uh, I think we still have six minutes. Okay, so I will ask you for another uh, set of four ASCII characters, please. No. J1, L, 3. That's a nice one. So as, we s as we've seen, it will probably not find it because there are too many uh, combinatorics for uh, four characters. So it will uh, find, fi uh, search, 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 but uh, within even one hour, I'm not sure it will find it. And now we will do something really important that was uh, the core idea I was trying to uh, explain before. Uh, let's say that um, the condition will be expressed differently. And that's also 
uh, why you need to use your imagination about business code because uh, business code uh, bugs are not as obvious as here they, are, they depend on many things and they uh, and the trace contains many lines actually executed so let's write an equivalent uh, condition but that will look at the uh, input um, byte by byte so it's uh, let's say we want the first character to be uh, G, the second to be 1, the third to be uh, L, and the last one to be 3. To be 3, yes. So I've kept this uh, thing in, uh, uh, in commands, so you can see uh, maybe it's the right moment to uncommand this one, otherwise it would panic for no good reason. Okay, we are interested only in long-ish uh, strings. And it would panic as soon as a st string is starting with this prefix. But, um, mm, yes. The condition is slightly different beca because here it was uh, looking for this exact pattern and here it's only a condition about the four first characters. But the, the core idea is that also it's basically the same. Uh, it's as hard to find this one or this one. It doesn't make much of a difference. I suspect that it will find uh, J1L3 in this case. And uh, do you understand why it will or it should find this bug? Any idea? Yes? Because the code coverage increases. As yes. As soon as it, uh, used to uh, yes, it will exactly. I expect the fuzzing to generate by random some things that start with a capital G, and this will allow it to execute this line of code. So it, so it knows it needs to keep it and to mutate it until something interesting happens again. And then, uh, it will have, by random chance, the two first letters and it will dig deeper and deeper until it finds a panic. And when it found a panic, it won. It stops and it says, you have a bug, uh, fix it. So I really, really hope that also we've seen that G1L3 was a difficult pattern to, to find by random. It, it wasn't finding it with the previous assertion. With this one, which is logically equivalent, but uh, written in a different way that requires more lines of code, I do hope that it will find it. Please be with me on that. Pray for me to work. Yes, found the bug for input J1L3. It could have been slightly longer, but it said, oh yes, it was a 31 byte uh, string that uh, made it fail, but it, it has minimized it for our uh, comfort and delight. So it, it did find the bug thanks to uh, the code coverage um, technology of instrumentation. I find it, this really fascinating and this will be useful in your actual project. Yes, question? That you would suggest that we write the code in a different way in order for fuzzing to be able to detect things? Uh, not really. I mean, that's why I was talking about using imagination. I mean, business code is already untangled like a spaghetti code, function calling everywhere, many parameters. Some of them are useful, some are, are not. So there are so many uh, moving parts in actual code that uh, a human is not expected to to detect anything where there is some wiggle, wiggle room to have bugs. But the further is here for us for that. You do not need to write your code in a different way. However, you do need to write the fuzzing function in a way that we, uh, that we can express the state uh, before the function or the, all of the inputs of the function as something that is either a, a, a string or a byte of slice or a set of arguments that can be numbers. So right now it doesn't cu um, um, support custom structs. So you have to find a way to, uh, uh, to marshal or unmarshal things to have them expressed in a simple bytes or numbers. But that's pretty straightforward actually. And yes, I insist you do not need to rewrite the code of the application itself to switch fuzzing, it should work. 
When is it appropriate, useful or necessary uh, to do fuzzing? In principle, in all the cases where you need to process data, including simple user requests, which is in fact the majority of IT projects. I highly recommend it for servers, of course, but also in all projects that involve decoding input files. If you're writing a parser for JPEG files or to unpack a compressed archive, then you absolutely need to set up an intensive fuzzing strategy before releasing. This is not a new concept, by the way, fuzzing has been used extensively in search projects for decades and applies to many programming languages. As a conclusion, you may take the blue pill and not do any fuzzing because you have enough trust in all the building blocks of your project to decide that it's not worth it. But this incurs a risk that it doesn't end up very well. Or you take the red pill, which consists of preventively including fuzzing in your pipeline of tests and validation. And this will reduce the probability that the name of your company will make it to the front page of the internet for the wrong reason. Thank you so much for listening to me. I don't have time for live questions, but I will be there, so don't hesitate to reach to me. Uh, two QR codes in case uh, you do write some Java code. Uh, OSS Fuzz exists to do some uh, fuzzing in Java. Uh, yes, it's a good time to, to scan the QR code. It's on um, uh, Google security blog. I have not tried it, but it is nice because it is basically compatible with all of the JVM uh, li based languages. OSS Fuzz. I'm keeping it just 10 more seconds. And then if you want to help me, uh, if you enjoyed the talk and if you want to help me spread the word about fuzzing, I have this fantastic QR code it, that contains many uh, randomized inputs. Uh, it's pretty safe to scan. The URL inside is safe. It opens Twitter. So I give you my word. Uh, no one will be singing, uh, never gonna give you up here. It's only about tweeting something nice for the community. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>